Good afternoon and good evening. My name is Ali Kanani, a member of the Executive Committee of the Swiss Business Council Dubai and Northern Emirates, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. First of all, we would like to express our deepest sorrow at the passing of His Highness Sheikh Hamdan bin Rashid Al Maktoum, Deputy Ruler of Dubai and the UAE and Minister of Finance. We express our most sincere and profound condolences to His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, Vice President and Prime Minister of the UAE and Ruler of Dubai, as well as to the Al Maktoum family and to the people of the UAE. The United Arab Emirates signed the Abraham Accords with the State of Israel last summer. In the spirit of optimism, new markets open, as well as opportunities between companies and institutions. The focus of today's webinar is to discuss opportunities to strengthen cooperation between Israel and the UAE amongst the Swiss business community. Today, we have qualified panelists from both sides who will outline the position of the three interesting topics under the spotlight, namely health tech, food tech, and fintech. Just a few housekeeping points. Please ask any questions via the Q&A chat box at any time during today's event, and the event will be recorded for everyone and be shared later. And with that, I would like to open the webinar by handing over to Peter Haradi, the president of the Swiss Business Council, Dubai and Northern Emirates. Dear compatriots, can you hear me? Yes, can everybody hear me? Ah, very good. That's it, can you all hear me now? <laughs> okay, dear compatriots, dear friends of Switzerland, Salam Alaikum, Guten Abend, Bonsoir, Buonasera, Good Evening, and Erev Tov. I welcome the Israel, Switzerland, and Liechtenstein Chamber of Commerce and thank their excellencies, Jean Daniel Rush, Swiss Ambassador to Israel, and Massimo Baggi, Swiss Ambassador to the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, for initiating this webinar. Times have definitely changed, as such a politically charged webinar would not have been possible only six months ago. I always maintain that clarity and communications are the secret to successful harmony. How many conflicts have started due to misunderstandings, lack of communications and language barriers? Thankfully, today's technology allows easier contact, which should reduce world strife. I said, should. I therefore hope that we'll be able to cooperate closely between the UAE and Israel in order to promote the excellent quality services and products produced by Swiss companies and persuade everybody that we are not only about banks, watches, cheese and chocolates. We might be slightly more expensive than other countries, but quality has to be paid, especially as the cheap solution always ends up being a lot more expensive. So finally, I wish you all a successful and interesting webinar. Mas salama, ufidaluga, Au revoir, arrivederci, goodbye, shalom. Thank you, Peter. Um, I'll now pass over to Gideon Hamburger, President of the Israel, Switzerland and Liechtenstein Chamber of Commerce. Okay, I guess we'll be hearing from uh, Gideon Hamburger a little later on. Um, it's now time to head over to our panelists and we will go to the UAE representative uh, who will be speaking about health tech, Ms. Raja Daher. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, first, I would like to uh, thank uh, the organizer behind this event, and in specific, the Swiss Business Council uh, that I will be representing uh, in this webinar, and of course, uh, all the people who participate in this event. Uh, my uh, challenge is going uh, to represent health tech as an opportunity in UAE in just five minutes, and I'm really going to do my best to walk you through. Healthcare sector in UAE has experienced a tremendous growth over the past decade. It's still uh, expected to grow within a continuous annual growth rate of 7.5 in 2021. Public health sector and health authority has proven, uh, has ensured the best and highest quality of medical support uh, to provide uh, the best and uh, the fast and very uh, constructed uh, medical support during the pandemic uh, of COVID-19. Thus, we believe that they made it successfully. 
Uh, innovation as a vision, uh, since 2015, innovation has been uh, considered as a core pillar of all strategic national, uh, strategic uh, plan, uh, strategic agenda, and according to the Ministry of Health and uh, Prevention, MOHAP in UAE, uh, the strategy for 2019-2021 is one main objective where UAE is a leading international destination for suitable for uh, uh, sorry, for sustainable future in the smart healthcare. And this is going to be, uh, this is, is planned to be achieved through three main pillars. Renovation of the entire healthcare services, development of research center and establishment of local and international partnership. Uh, last but not least, uh, uh, incorporate and adopt all the highest technology in order to uh, prepare the government in a way that it will be able uh, to avoid or prevent or manage a similar pandemic as uh, COVID-19. Uh, unlike other markets, uh, the major concern of uh, the government in UAE is to focus on one uh, main uh, aspect, which is improve patients' outcome. UAE is account, uh, uh, sorry, UAE accounts for approximately 26% of the total health expenditure in the GCC, which is equivalent to 69 billion uh, dollars in 2020. UAE is ranked on the top 20 countries in the world in healthcare spending per capita, uh, $15.5 billion has been uh, approved as a budget uh, only for Dubai uh, in 2021, where health and infrastructure are the top focus. Uh, we believe uh, that uh, the uh, adoption uh, of uh, the new smart technologies uh, to modernize the healthcare uh, uh, ecosystem in the UAE uh, will help or uh, predict to add a $182 billion to its economy in 2035. Uh, please, I'd like to highlight here that we need to be a bit cautious with the, with the figures uh, due to the uh, shock of the uh, pandemic. I mean, uh, slight uh, points might be considered uh, as an adjustment. It's obvious that the UAE uh, uh, is not anymore in the area of the standard uh, uh, medical equipment and uh, standard uh, medical devices. Uh, the trend in the healthcare term nowadays is more into artificial intelligence, uh, augmented reality, uh, virtual uh, care, electronic intensive care units, uh, robotic, data monetizations, digital transformation, telehealth, telemedicines, uh, internet uh, over uh, things, remote monitoring, uh, and especially in advanced uh, sensors and uh, devices uh, versus uh, real, uh, real time. Uh, virtual reality, uh, which is used as uh, healthcare training, uh, last but not, but not least, the medical devices, which is a business expanded to be booming, uh, and they reach $14.4 million uh, by uh, 2022. Uh, therefore, the quality of care is no longer the key to success. It is the efficiency and care and of care and cost. I'd like to highlight uh, two points majorly. Uh, uh, artificial intelligence ad adoptions are initiated by the government in this country. Uh, there are many successful uh, examples of uh, 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 initiatives uh, related to health tech. I will be choosing only two. Dubai Health Authority partnership with Aqua Healthcare in 2018 uh, to use the uh, chest X-ray screening uh, program, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, proved to be very successful. It ensures 95% accuracy in identification of tuberculosis and 28% reduction in screening time. The launch of artificial intelligence uh, lab in Abu Dhabi Department of Health in 2019, it is the first of its kind in the region where it's able to leverage and develop artificial intelligence and related uh, tech, uh, health tech. Artificial intelligence is likely to be as an integral part of the uh, uh, daily activity of almost three, uh, sorry, 3 million uh, GCC patients in 2023. Uh, 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 there are uh, uh, some pillars more that I would like to highlight. For example, an estimated there is an estimation that the atomic, uh, sorry, the adoption and usage of uh, robots uh, tools in healthcare uh, would account for twenty billion dollars in the Middle East by twenty twenty three. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> so, Raja, thank you very much for that. Uh, for that, uh, your five minutes, you you were bang on it. So, so well done. Um, now, uh, I think we have David Beagleisen back and ready to go. So we'll go to him. Uh, he's a representative from Israel and he will be talking about health tech there. Over to you, David. Thank you very much. So I, uh, I had some connectivity issues. I hope we'll, uh, you, you can see me and hear me well. Um, where, and I was not able to hear 
all of uh, the presentation before, so sorry for that. I might have do some uh, linkage be between. But let's use these five minutes to talk a bit about the uh, health tech sector in Israel. Maybe before I'll just say a few words about overall the high tech uh, Israeli sector because it gives us um, it will give us a bit of more perspective. But Noga, you will have to help me to uh, disable the share screening. I'll start uh, as you do that. So generally speaking, uh, the Israeli high tech sector, as I probably most of you know, uh, is booming and is uh, growing fastly for, for the last uh, uh, decades. And, um, uh -huh. and the, the number of the, the following, we have uh, the highest number of startups per capita, per person, per square meter, it just means that we have a lot of startups and not a lot of land or, or people. Uh, just a bit of the numbers, uh, 2020 was a record year in terms of uh, investment. We've seen about $10 billion, even in the midst of a pandemic, uh, invested directly in startups. And there was also a very uh, impressive numbers in terms of M&As and IPOs. Just to compare a bit, because we are uh, here at the Swiss Embassy, uh, 2019, we've seen a ratio of about 2.3 billion in Switzerland invested in startup and in Israel it was a bit uh, less than uh, 8 billion. But um, this high tech sector is very diverse and let's uh, go straight and talk about the digital health and the health sector. I decided to start with a quote from uh, Forbes uh, from last September, as Israeli locks down, its health tech sector scaled up. And this is something that we've seen, which was uh, pretty remarkable. Uh, of course, this pandemic had a lot of effects and negative effects on our personal life, also on the, some sectors of the economy. Um, in the health tech sector, it was not the case. And uh, for some of those uh, business models and startups, it was a big, big boost because we've seen a tremendous need in uh, providing health remotely. So we can look at these subsectors, um, and uh, we have about 500 companies active in all of them. We're talking about digital therapeutics, remote monitoring, clinical workflow, decision support, and, on, and I can send you later if someone is interested the slide. The last year, we've saw a rising creation of net new startups and also uh, good flow of funds and funding in terms of that. And, and you will see in, in a minute that uh, 2020 was pretty remarkable uh, on that matter. I decided to talk about a few examples that maybe will give you a perspective about uh, the opportunities and, and some of the interesting things that are happening. Um, the first one will be in the decision support subsector. Uh, so Zebra, uh, medical uh, Vision is a leading AI FDA cleared product. Uh, they are installed in many hospitals along uh, all over the world. And basically they are providing help for doctors and radiologists to uh, take decision upon um, how to treat and how to um, examine uh, all of those, all of this uh, area. And uh, they raised about $52 million. And this is where we see a lot of visual processing technologies really entering this, uh, uh, this sector. Very quickly, Taito is providing the possibility to remote monitor yourself. So they have a kit where you can uh, check your blood pressure, your temperature, your heartbeat. And then you have a doctor, which is uh, it's streamlined directly to him. One um, minute, David. One minute. Yes, no problem. I'll skip uh, Healthy IO, which is also an interesting company. Talk about K Health. K Health basically shows you what uh, happened in Israel during the last 20 years, where there were a lot of investments in the public healthcare sector to go digital. And they were able to use this anonymized data information in order to do some AI processing and, and help doctors take decisions. And only in 2020, I will end here, Ali, uh, they raised $220 million. So we can see that this is a fast growing company with a lot of interesting things happening. I hope I'm on time. You are under time, actually. But thank, thank you very much for that, David. Uh, so the next part of the webinar will be on food tech. And we would like to go to the UAE representative for this, uh, Mr. Michael Haraghi. Over to you, Michael. Hello, everybody. Um, first of all, I would like to um, thank the organizers, the business councils and participants of this webinar today. 
my name is Michael Harrity. I'm the head of the uh, Agritech Group of the Swiss Business Council uh, that has been recently formed. I'd just like to start by giving uh, you all a little bit of information on the UAE and its agriculture and why food tech and, you know, to a, to a certain extent, agri-tech has an important future in the UAE. The UAE, especially the Northern Emirates, um, has a tradition in farming, especially during winter, which obviously is summer here, it gets quite hot. Uh, the last 10 years has seen a rise in local produce and farming. Today, there are more than 30,000 farms in the UAE, uh, which is an exponential increase from the early 70s, which only saw 4,000 farms. Uh, the major crops that are currently being produced in the UAE are dates, which are actually 6% of the world's date production is based in the UAE. Tomatoes, cabbages, eggplant, and melons, and then we also have citrus fruits and mangoes, which are produced uh, relatively extensively. Due to the COVID pandemic um, and the breakdown and delays in logistical chains, uh, local farming and safe sustainability has come to the forefront as it has in many countries. Uh, this was already on the UAE agenda before, um, before the pandemic and this now has just increased uh, the awareness of it even more. Um, the general public is also a lot more aware of health issues relating to pesticides and, and herbicides, which of course promotes organic farming, which again, you know, comes highly under the um, uh, food tech and agri tech. Currently, however, a few issues that we do have is 80% of the food is produced, uh, sorry, is currently imported. And the main issues we have in the UAE are heat, uh, water supply, and of course, salinity. Now, there have been a few government initiatives uh, recently. In June of 2020, the UAE cabinet has introduced a national strategy for sustainable agriculture which increases, aims to increase three main points, which are efficiency, self-sufficiency, and the reduce of water usage. Also recently, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum uh, of the ruler of Dubai has come, um, introduced a 2040 master plan, which is increasing the Dubai's population from 3.3 million to 5.8 million in 20 years, and increase the green spaces within Dubai. Now, obviously, this doesn't relate directly to food tech and agri-tech. However, uh, the technology that is very important for food tech and agri-tech, such as water saving, will obviously be a part of that if they want to increase uh, the green spaces. Now, why is it a good opportunity for Swiss companies? Everybody knows the Swiss are uh, very good when it comes to high tech and technology. Um, and Switzerland and Swiss companies are very well respected in the UAE. Uh, this gives a, a great opportunity for Swiss agricultural and technological, technological know-how uh, to come to the UAE. We obviously know that Israel has been involved in vertical and indoor farming for a while, and uh, they, if not, if not one of the pioneering, maybe one of the, uh, the pioneers in, in uh, food tech and agri-tech, and I'm sure that there are a lot of Swiss companies that are already involved in Israel um, that would be interested in coming to the OE uh, because it's being pushed so hard here as well. Obviously, Swiss investors uh, too. I mean, uh, this is a great chance. This is the future, um, especially in the UAE where, where technology will be vital to food tech and, and, uh, and uh, agricultural technology. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Michael. So it's now time to go back to David Beagleisen, who will be talking about food tech as well. Thank you, David. Thank you, Ali. Um, I, I think that uh, I can stress uh, more what Michael said about the need and the, the challenges that uh, make that humanity faces, which makes this sector uh, so vital and so interesting. And uh, we've seen also in this area a lot of uh, Swiss interest in um, what's happening here in terms of R&D in um, subtech, in agricultural uh, technology, irrigations. Uh, now it's even called desert tech, energy tech. 
And uh, I think that today it's a very exciting time to be an entrepreneur or an investor in, the, in that sector. I remember going to uh, some the early first conferences that was uh, held in Israel about food technology, agri-tech, food tech. Those were names that uh, five, seven years ago was not that common. And many people were not really uh, into that area. A lot of investors were focusing on the more mature part of the, uh, the high-tech sector here in Israel. And um, I'll share my screen. And I think that this has changed. Um, and today we can find uh, a very uh, healthy, but we have to acknowledge still an early stage high tech sector, uh, cannot compare the numbers to what's happening in other areas like fintech or cyber security or, or, or even health tech that we've just discussed before, but it grows and it grows fast. And I think that people realize that this is crucial and this should be a vital part of, of R&D, which is happening. And this is being acknowledged also on a national level. So uh, we can see if, uh, if we look at the public sector support, the Israeli Innovation Authority <clears throat> uh, invested a lot last year in order to support the creation of um, incubators, VC incubators that are supported by them, also corporate innovation labs. And there's also the Ministry of Agriculture, which is uh, focusing on providing a very supportive environment for startups, uh, which we can see now it's growing very rapidly. It's about 400 startups that are trying to innovate and uh, invent the future of uh, our, uh, how we consume, how we supply food, how we grow food, um, and also a rising interest in terms of investors. There have been um, 76 deals in 2019. 2020, the numbers are rising. And we also see a lot of interest from multinational companies. Um, I, I must say that personally, we've, we are very active, relatively very active in that field because we see companies from Switzerland, which are leaders as well in, in, in these areas like Nestle has, uh, has some operations here and we see Migo and Givoda and Firminish and other companies that are coming in order to look for new opportunities how to partner with innovative companies, how to maybe acquire them, how to invest in them. And uh, just to give you, a, uh, and they are not alone. It's uh, there's tough competition. Everybody's here. There's also PepsiCo and Unilever and other Mondelez. Um, there's tough competition on finding the good um, innovative ideas and companies. Um, just to end up with a small uh, Swiss example, uh, we, we are in contact with Innovopo, which is uh, an Israeli company led by Tali Nehushtan, a CEO, and uh, they have some Swiss investors and partners, and um, they, they are active in alternative food sources, so they are trying to provide uh, uh, alternative protein from uh, natural protein, so they have very good cost efficient and more important energy efficient way to extract protein from uh, chickpeas. So uh, pois or hummus, um, and um, this is this is fascinating to to see what's happening in this whole area. Also with meatless meat, uh, maybe the most famous one is Beyond Meat, an American company, but there's a lot happening here. And um, th this innovation is going along uh, the whole chain, so supply chain preservation, food processing, input production, and. Um, I think that this is an area which will, will continue and probably in a few years will be very interesting what come up from those uh, international collaboration between uh, international companies and Israel and hopefully also the UAE, definitely. Um, but, but this is something that people realize more and more also in Israel that we need to innovate our, uh, in this area because of all of those challenges that climate change and other processes are putting pressure on our uh, um, way that we consume, produce, and distribute food. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. I uh, just wanted to remind everyone that please ask your questions in the Q&A chat box at any time during the webinar. Um, it's now time to move on to the fintech portion of the presentations. Uh, we'll actually be going to David Elsass now. Uh, so I'd like to hand the platform over to him. Over to you, Dave. Thank you, Ali. Thanks, everyone. Um, thank you for the councils for organizing this and for the listeners who are 
bear with us. If we talk about fintech, we're talking about the technology that applies to the financial sector. And obviously, as we all know, Switzerland is a leader in the financial services industry worldwide, specifically when it comes to private banking, investment management, um, but some of the Swiss banks are also world leaders in global terms. Um, so it is quite natural that Switzerland has taken a big position or a leading position in the fintech industry, providing a number of solutions, specifically when it comes to the tokenization, so issuing tokens, um, which are crypto assets, and then of course, also the ledger technology. Um, I think a windfall or a watershed moment was in 2015 when Ethereum decided to choose Zug as its um, headquarters, which created what we call the Crypto Valley in Switzerland. Um, but that is just one example of that. Um, that was followed later on by Libra, the Facebook um, initiative, actually now called Diem, to establish itself in Geneva, where they will, where the project is to issue a global stable coin plus payment system. Um, and that in itself is again, something that is uh, fundamental and will change, I believe, um, payment systems and so forth fundamentally. So what makes Switzerland, besides the fact that there's a big banking industry um, so attractive? It is a very innovative country and it has created um, excellent ecosystems for innovating companies. And one of the things that makes Switzerland very attractive is the legislator, the progressiveness of FINMA, the financial market regulator or the banking regulator, uh, but also um, uh, Parliament. In, 20, in 2019, um, the FINMA issued a few new licenses, one of which is the, FINMA, uh, the FinTech license, which allows companies who benefit of such a license to raise capital from the public, um, which fundamentally would help, help them to raise up to 100 million Swiss francs, about $100 million, and to act as um, uh, a public fundraising platform. This obviously would then help with the, with the issuance of tokens and financial uh, digital assets. Government has also passed in September 2020 a number of laws. Um, one is the Distributed Ledger Technology Act, which allows companies to issue their or to hold their share registry in blockchain format, which is also um, quite progressive and new. The custody service provider legislation, which allows, which offers a clear and simplified regulation for digital custody service providers. And so Switzerland today has a number of uh, digital banks that allow people to deposit cryptocurrencies and fiat assets and have the, those managed. Um, again, for the size of the country that is um, in a leading position, and today, most of the investments, when we look at the investments and where they go in the fintech industry in Switzerland, about two thirds go, and it's nearly equal, about two thirds of all the investments in startups go towards the investment management sector. And the other half of that, so the other third goes towards digital banking infrastructure. So all that makes of Switzerland today um, a very interesting place for the fintech industry. And I have no doubt that um, Israel being also a very advanced and uh, you know, the startup nation par excellence, um, where a lot of FinTech solutions are being designed, um, could benefit from Switzerland as, um, as a partner because we have the right legislation, we have the right infrastructure. So today, if you look at the ecosystem, and I think ecosystem is really what attracts companies um, and capital, Switzerland, has about 10%, represents about 10% of all the fintech companies in Europe. And if you look at the population, the size of the population of Switzerland in the whole of Europe, that is quite remarkable. Um, Zurich has established itself as the crypto hub um, in Switzerland in particular, but in Europe, and it comes um, quite closely after London and Paris and Stockholm. Geneva, as I said earlier, has established itself um, as a hub for uh, blockchain technology. And it's quite interesting because the FinTech industry has um, sprouts into different technologies and different industries. So for example, um, some of today's, uh, some of Switzerland's watchmakers have started to use blockchain 
technology in order to register the ownership of some of the more expensive pieces. So you don't only buy a watch, but you also get a token with all the information and the ownership that is linked to that watch, for example. And so um, when we talk about the fintech industry, um, it starts at financial services, it starts at um, financial transactions, uh, but that same technology will go into general ownership. Um, as an example, we are a relatively a medium-sized asset management company out of Switzerland, out of Geneva in particular, but one of our businesses is called Fintech Solutions. We are also um, uh, the co-founders of the Swiss, of, sorry, of the Geneva Fintech Association, and we were one of the first companies together with a partner company of ours called We Can Tokenize to tokenize uh, real estate assets. So in 2019, uh, we were, um, if not the first, amongst the first to issue real estate tokens, investments that they represent real estate fractional ownership in real estate investments. And um, like our company, there are many companies in Switzerland that um, are extremely progressive. So mindful of the time that was allotted to me, I'll, I'll keep it at this. But in conclusion, I think that Switzerland is a center of expertise in uh, technology in general, into financial technology in particular, that's what I'm talking about. And I think that Switzerland has a role to play in helping certain Israeli tech companies, fintech companies perhaps, to bridge um, the technological side together with the practical side of the actual industry that we are applying ourselves to, the financial industry. And Switzerland is um, an expert in that uh, respect. And I think, and, and it's not just I think, there are many, many um, joint ventures, there are many cooperations between Israeli companies and Swiss companies. Um, and I decided not to name any today, so I haven't named a single company. But okay. um, it is quite clear that Switzerland has a role to play there. Thank you very much, Dave, thank you. <clears throat> so thanks for your words there. Uh, we'll now go on to the last presentation, uh, and that's back over again to David Beagleisen uh, from the Israeli side. So over to you, sir. Thank you very much, um, David. That was very, very interesting, and uh, we are also fascinated by what's happening recently in. Uh, in, in Switzerland in terms of the framework regulation and uh, very keen to see where the new law about uh, security tokens will lead us and what kind of uh, opportunities that will uh, uh, unleash for, for, for new entrepreneurs, new visionaries. And uh, just, just as a side note, you mentioned that the Ethereum uh, Foundation is based in Zouk and uh, so, so Vitalik uh, Buterin uh, spent about a year before uh, before that uh, in, in Israel in, in a blockchain company in Israel and uh, he decided to go to Switzerland in order to initiate his white paper. Just an anecdote. But uh, definitely uh, we are in the intersection here between uh, what's happening in Israel in terms of the vibrant community that uh, are building new stuff, new innovating um, business models, new technologies, and, and trying to uh, really make the good connection between what Switzerland has to offer, which I will not go over because David really, um, really described that very well. And we see, uh, we see that a lot. About two years ago, we had a seminar where we brought representative from the Ministry of Finance, from uh, uh, leading lawyers and uh, accountants and uh, entrepreneurs and FINMA uh, to come to talk to the Israeli community uh, about what Switzerland has to offer for startups and for, for innovative, um, innovative companies. And just because it's a very short presentation to give you a glimpse about uh, the, the vibrant community. So fin FinTech is a very mature, relatively mature sector in the high tech sector industry. Um, we, we have a lot of companies active in the payment uh, subsector in trading and investing and lending in insure tech. Uh, and of course, anti-fraud and FinTech were here we can see a, a combination of the strength of the cybersecurity uh, sector in Israel working with the financial uh, institutions. And, and of course, uh, as David talked a lot about blockchain, this is also something which is vibrant. Uh, blockchain has its ups and downs. We were very active two and a half years ago. Uh, but then as the people in, in the blockchain industry said, they came the blockchain winter, but now we see a revival of what's happening uh, thanks to uh, maybe Bitcoin going from 5,000 to 50,000 or to the fact that 
you can now buy a Tesla with your Bitcoins uh, as of yesterday. Um, and But here there is a lot happening also in uh, the academic sectors in terms of research about um, uh, blockchain technology, technology, distributed ledger technologies, uh, but also in startups and new protocols, uh, which uh, uh, you can see in the, there in, in blockchain, Bancor was uh, the biggest uh, Israeli uh, ICO, and they decided uh, to do that in Switzerland. So here, this is exactly what we are trying to uh, uh, mix together, the, the strength of each ecosystem. I'll just take uh, one example, because this is something which is uh, in, in the news. Um, so Ito has just announced uh, a week ago, so I thought that would be relevant to, to, uh, to mention that here, that uh, here is a trading company with some social aspect on that and also providing the ability to uh, um, trade cryptocurrencies going uh, public with a valuation of $10 billion. It doesn't happen any day. It's a huge story. Um, and, and last year we had uh, Lemonade that went public with a big uh, market cap and also wanted to mention that when uh, a leading Israeli bank, Bank Lumi, decided to go and uh, establish a digital bank, they decided a Swiss partner uh, to provide them the technology. And, and I will maybe just end on the, um, the, the global aspect of this ecosystem. Um, and I, I'm talking a lot about the Swiss connection, but it's a global one. And, there's a lot happening and also recently a lot happening with interest from the UAE. Um, the Israeli high-tech economy cannot exist with the linkage of the global ecosystem. And it's usually, uh, you say that an Israeli startup is born global, which means that they have to think from day one of going abroad. The Israeli market is very small. It's not enough to sustain so many startups. And something uh, very positive happened that when success came for a few pioneers, Israeli startups that were uh, showed enough uh, success for international interest to look into the Israeli uh, high-tech sector. It happened the, uh, also in the FinTech hub, and now you can see really a good presence of organizations like banks, insurance, payments, and others that are active here with their offices doing R&D, sometimes hiring local scouts. And we are also, of course, trying to do that in Switzerland to raise awareness for the strength of Switzerland in Israel and the other way around. So uh, I, Ali, I see that my time is up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, David, once, once again. Um, so <laughs> that concludes the uh, presentations. Thank you to all the panelists for your insights into your uh, respective fields. Um, we'd now like to begin the Q&A session. So please keep your questions coming in. Uh, we've had a few already, so I'd like to start with uh, Raja Daher, uh, the health tech sector. Um, what are the main challenges to penetrating the UAE market? Uh, I believe the, the pandemic, COVID-19, is always a challenge in the healthcare sector as well as in any other sector. Uh, one should really realize that uh, UAE uh, has a population of 9.94 almost million people where 88% of them are expats and only 12% are uh, Emirati distributed over seven Emirates. Uh, the big challenge for the healthcare uh, system is uh, the Ministry of Health, which is called here MOHAP, Ministry of Health and Prevention. Uh, despite the fact that it's the federal regulation uh, part uh, or authority that register uh, the uh, uh, medicine and uh, uh, medical uh, equipment. It has no authority, a uh, direct authority on the operation and the management of the healthcare sectors in two main Emirates, which are uh, uh, Abu Dhabi and Dubai. Hence, uh, if anybody really uh, uh, has, I think, to penetrate this market, he needs to do their due diligence regarding uh, the health uh, authority from one perspective and the uh, customer uh, or the client perspective. Last but at least, we're expecting a lot of merge and acquisitions during this part as a consequence of uh, uh, the pandemic. Thank you, Raja. Great answer. Um, next, uh, we'll be going to Michael Haradine, our food tech expert. So, uh, Michael, uh, is the UAE having issues with water shortages and are there any current solutions, please? Oh, um, yes, we live in a desert, so uh, unfortunately water isn't, uh, isn't as available, uh, readily available as, uh, you know, 
a, a rainforest. But um, yeah, I mean, do we, we do have desalination plants. Uh, obviously, there are uh, certain facilities that have desalination plants themselves. Um, we also, there are a lot of products which uh, help in water retention. Uh, for example, outdoor agricultural farming, there are products which you can put in the soil, even organic now, uh, which help uh, maintain the water rather than lose it through evapotranspiration or even, uh, you know, uh, well, evaporation and, and through the, the soil. And uh, they do a lot of cloud seeding here, uh, which uh, everybody obviously, you know, it's, it's official, so um, uh, make it rain. But um, yeah, I mean, there are, that would be the main issue, obviously heat. Uh, heat is a big one in summer, um, hence uh, the importance for uh, technology in, in being able to, to increase productivity, really. Thank you very much, Michael. Yes, we, we all know about the cloud seeding. Um, next, we'll go to David Beagleisen, the uh, expert from uh, the Israeli side. Um, do you think, we've had this one question in, do you think that the high-tech sector will continue to grow in 2021? Okay, that, that's a tough one. <clears throat> uh, I think that I will go with, um, I'm, I don't know, uh, but I think that as long as, uh, let's say, uh, economy or the financial sector doesn't fall apart, uh, I think that the high-tech sector, and we can see that with what happened last year, is definitely on the winner side of uh, all of this disruption that happened with, uh, with the pandemic. Uh, we are now using Zoom, all of us. Uh, we got used to that. We, we, we change a lot of what we did thanks to technology, and there's a lot of winners on that side. So I think that the good companies in the high-tech sectors for sure has a bright uh, future. Uh, but I will, I will emphasize the I don't know part because uh, there is so much that happened this year that uh, doing forecasts is a bit uh, risky. But I, I think that definitely the high-tech sector is on the winner side of what happened uh, in 2020 and going on. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you for that, David. Um, we'll now go to Dave Elsass, fintech expert for the UAE side. Um, in your view, how can Swiss investors and companies benefit or participate in this historic opportunity for new investments and transfer of knowledge between Israel and the UAE? Yeah, thank, thanks for this question. Um, so obviously, first of all, companies that are the crossroads of technology will be able to benefit from, from this, provided take the initiative. When we talk about investors, um, we've read in the, in the press in the last few weeks, a whole range of investment programs and joint ventures between the UAE and Israel. Um, but all these are government to government. Um, we, for example, at Geneva Management Group are setting up uh, what I believe is to be the first um, investment fund based in Dubai, in the IFC, um, managed out of Switzerland, and where the investments will be directed towards Israeli companies and technology, but not solely, also European technology and companies um, that could benefit from um, operating in or being present in the Middle East, specifically in the Emirates. So there are, and I'm sure we'll we won't be the first, perhaps we'll be the first one, probably not the last one. There'll be investment opportunities, passive. Um, and I think that Swiss investors and others will be able to invest through those vehicles and benefit from this new trend, the trend of investment between these two regions, these two countries. Thank you very much, David. Uh, we'll go back to Raja now, a health tech expert from the UAE. Um, could you list some business slash health categories that could be a potential investment for a newcomer to the region? Uh, honestly speaking, when we talk about health tech, I think five minutes was not enough. But anyway, I'd like to highlight that medical tourism is really a very interesting scope of business where a lot of uh, investment is put from the side of the government in UAE. Uh, of course, uh, diabetes and obos obesity sorry, is a huge business in this part of the world, despite the investment still put due to the diagnosis. I think we have currently 32 million uh, patients diagnosed uh, in UAE, uh, which, sorry, in, the, in this part of the world, 
uh, I mean, in the region where they expected to double within maybe 20 years, if not less. After Corona, I think they will be even in less time. Uh, last but not least, uh, cardiology uh, uh, department, or let's say cardiology business, pediatric uh, business, as in general, as a sector or as type of business, uh, yet there is a, a lot of investment have been done uh, behind, but uh, it is still a, an area where uh, there is a huge potential behind. Thanks, as always, Raja, that was excellent. Um, we have a question for Michael Haradine, our food tech expert from the UAE. Um, are organic food prices competitive in the local market? They're getting there. Um, I think the interest is definitely there. Um, you know, you, we used to have five years ago, maybe maybe even a little bit more, one or two organic shops. Now they they are sprouting around everywhere. So. Uh, definitely the, the interest from the public is there. And um, the one thing that will make organic food um, more competitive is uh, basically using organic products instead of chemicals. So um, organic fertilizers, organic um, you know, um, products that help water retention, as I said before, will increase yields uh, without using chemical fertilizers, you know, your traditional MPK. Um, so that it, we, it will get there. As of now, it's not as competitive as uh, people would like it to be. However, people are still buying it. The interest is, is a lot more and people are willing to spend more money on organic products because they know of, of, of all the chemicals and, and that is involved in your traditional, let's say, uh, farming. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Uh, we now have a question, and uh, as this is a Swiss platform and true Swiss efficiency, it's one question, but for two panelists, and they're both called David. So I would like to ask, but this is the question, I would like to ask David and David, uh, how do they see the role of Swiss banks present in the UAE, uh, and in which way can they facilitate the process of economic growth between Israel and the UAE? So we'll start with David Beagleisen, please. Uh, Ali, maybe we'll start with David because I'm I'm not sure I, I got I had some connection issues. So maybe if David can start first, you or you can repeat the question about. Okay, okay. Uh, we can start with uh, we can start the, we can start with Dave, David David first. Uh, Sorry I will for repeat that. the question. I will repeat the question. However, so if you can hear now, uh, I'd like to ask David. Uh, how they see the role of Swiss banks present in the UAE and how they can facilitate the process of economic growth between Israel and the UAE? It's a good question. Um, I'm afraid that my answer will be disappointing. Most Swiss banks who are present in the UAE are the private banks. And so we're talking about private investment and management of private assets, which does not necessarily lead to investment between the two countries. Um, what it will take probably is for Swiss banks in this region to um, make available investment products that focus on Israeli technology and um, Israeli um, UAE joint ventures. Um, but again, um, I think that is something that typically is catered for primarily by fund managers such as ourselves who will set up investment vehicles, which then perhaps will be distributed by Swiss banks to their investors and by raising money for those projects, obviously, indirectly, they will be supporting um, cross regional investments. Thank you, David Elsass. Now over to David Beagleiser. Yes, so um, I, I must be honest that I'm not um, an expert on, on, on that field, what's happening in, in with bank, Swiss banks uh, activities in, um, in the UAE. So, that's a bit above my pay grade, uh, but I can say that um, the presence of a lot of uh, the investment, com the Swiss investment community in Israel, that would it be banks or family offices or just private investors, uh, a, a lot is, is causing a dynamic of, um, there is a lot of new relationship that are, relationship that are happening. And there is a lot of uh, interactions between the local uh, investors, the local entrepreneurs and, and Swiss investors. And um, th this is um, 
this is a very healthy dynamic, which we, we want to see more in terms of Switzerland and Israel. And definitely if um, this dynamic and Swiss institution can play a role into interlinking um, the UAE ecosystem with, with the Israeli and play a role on that, that will definitely be a positive thing. I think that this event uh, in particular um, is, is something that uh, if we will see more interactions between Israeli and, and people from the UAE, if Switzerland can play a role uh, in being a bridge in, in any way that, that can only cause to uh, positive uh, outcomes. Um, so that was not an accurate uh, answer to your question, but I hope that that offers something. Thank you very much, uh, David. I'm just wary of the time now. We still have a few more participants um, for the webinar. I'd like to thank um, all of the panelists now for the Q&A session. I think that was excellently done. Uh, we now have uh, Gideon Hamburger with us uh, after some technical difficulties earlier. So I'll now pass over to Gideon Hamburger, the president of the Israel, Switzerland and Liechtenstein Chamber of Commerce. Gideon. Yes, thank you. I'm sorry about the technical problems, but it seems that uh, even with high tech and technology, still nothing is perfect. Uh, in any case, uh, dear all, shalom and salam aleikum and grüezi uh, mitanand. Uh, I'm very glad about the participation of the webinar today with the UAE in Israel with the help of our good friends from Switzerland. I hope the next meeting will take place face to face in Tel Aviv and in Dubai. Wishing all of us a successful week and uh, now a successful uh, webinar is already the end. It's, I think it was very, very successful. I in any way had the opportunity to listen and to hear. And the main thing is uh, keep healthy and thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words, Gideon. Uh, right now we are honored to be joined by our two ambassadors, His Excellency uh, Massimo Baggi, Ambassador of Switzerland and the United Arab Emirates in Bahrain, and His Excellency Jean-Daniel Rouche, Ambassador of Switzerland to Israel. They will be giving their conclusions and outlining the ways forward. Uh, I would like to start with His Excellency Massimo Baggi. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, first of all, let me congratulate you for your excellent moderation. I would like to uh, thank also the two uh, Chamber of Commerce and Swiss Business Council for taking this excellent uh, initiative. And finally, all my colleagues and friends from the embassy in Israel, in particular, my, my colleague, uh, Jean Daniel. You know, sometimes uh, history uh, suddenly accelerates and uh, sometimes it accelerates in the right direction. I think that this is exactly what happened with the Abraham uh, Accord. And this is exactly uh, the message that our uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs uh, wanted to highlight and highlight it when uh, he did his uh, official visit to our two countries at the end of last, uh, of last year. Uh, today, uh, you went uh, a step uh, forward, we went a step uh, forward, and I very much uh, appreciate uh, this work which has been done, and especially the fact that uh, you have chosen a very pragmatic approach on how to strengthen the relationship between our two countries in three specific uh, areas, uh, health, uh, food, and uh, fintech. I think that you all uh, convinced us uh, us that here there is indeed a potential for uh, cooperation. Nevertheless, I think that this is just the beginning of our uh, way forward. And I think that we have to go much more uh, in depth uh, before we will be able uh, to get uh, the first uh, result. And this is exactly what I would like you to encourage uh, to do. Eventually, in the same uh, three uh, sector, I would suggest that to go forward eventually with a, an event in presence and try to get together a bunch of uh, uh, companies on actors of the public and uh, the private uh, sector 
to uh, down uh, size uh, more uh, specific ways to uh, cooperate. And eventually this could be done in the next uh, few months in order to be able to uh, come uh, to the UAE uh, at the end uh, of the year. Because here in the UAE, we will have a unique uh, platform to show uh, whatever we uh, prepared and we, we, we want to show at a bigger, uh, in a bigger scale, which is Expo 2020 uh, Dubai. It's gonna happen. Uh, it's gonna start uh, beginning of uh, October for six months. And uh, we both have a, a wonderful pavilion. Uh, the Swiss pavilion will be uh, somehow presented uh, next week. Uh, I'm in contact already with the organizer of the Israeli uh, pavilion. I think that we have to use this platform to push our uh, cooperation uh, further. Uh, not only because we have uh, a house of Switzerland and uh, Israel, in the, uh, in the UAE, of course, uh, at Expo, but also because uh, this Expo for the first time uh, decided to have uh, 11 uh, thematic weeks. And during those weeks, uh, it is planned to get together with the many actors, uh, international and national, to highlight uh, 11 specific uh, thematic areas. And luckily enough, uh, we have a, a week, a thematic week at the Expo devoted to health. It will be uh, from the 30th of January to the 5th of February 22. Uh, we will have a, a food uh, week uh, between the uh, uh, 20th of February until the 26th of uh, February. Uh, we are already preparing events for those thematic weeks with our uh, partner, which are the most prestigious partner we can imagine to have for those uh, sectors. Uh, we have a Russian Novartis partner of the Swiss Pavilion, and with them we are preparing also this uh, thematic week. We have Nestle as a partner of the Swiss Pavilion, and we are preparing uh, with them also the food uh, week. I would say uh, we are lucky also because on uh, uh, FinTech, you may uh, know that uh, uh, all actors of the public and the private sector in Switzerland, finally, I would say, got together and create a platform to present the Swiss financial services in Switzerland and abroad. And this platform is called finance.swiss. Uh, don't hesitate uh, to, to check on the web. There is already content uh, that you can uh, download. And uh, Finance.Swiss uh, decided to have the UAE as a priority country for their activity this year and next year in view also of uh, Expo 2020 uh, 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 Dubai. So uh, we have for the three uh, areas uh, of, uh, of major interest that we selected, we have uh, excellent opportunity to show our uh, know-how and our uh, way to uh, get together uh, uh, in in the next uh, in the next one and a half years. I think it gives us enough uh, enough uh, uh, space and time to get uh, together with concrete uh, ideas. Uh, I would like to uh, to uh, to finish this uh, uh, short uh, uh, summary and highlight that uh, uh, the president of Switzerland uh, will be visiting the Expo for our national day. Uh, which is on the 29th of October of this year. And hopefully, being our Minister for Economy, he will be accompanied by a delegation of uh, business people from uh, Switzerland, uh, Mr. Uh, Parmela. And uh, in 22, we will have another uh, Swiss president coming to the Expo that will be for the uh, last month of the Expo end of March, uh, uh, President uh, Cassis uh, will be here uh, with us and uh, uh, to inaugurate uh, the water uh, week in our uh, pavilion uh, all month of March in uh, uh, 22 at Expo, the Swiss pavilion will be devoted to uh, water. So um, I would say, uh, let's take the opportunity uh, to have eventually for each and every of the three thematic areas, 
some uh, uh, intermediary uh, event or get together uh, to get even more precise on what we want to do eventually in Israel and then come to the UAE at the end of the year or beginning of next year to uh, get the opportunity to use this uh, unique platform of uh, Universal Expo to uh, show uh, our and your uh, project. So this is my um, suggestion uh, for the way forward. Uh, being uh, a representative of the of the of the public sector, we can only encourage you, and uh, uh, we are here to help you to display uh, your project. But of course, the decision is yours. We are here to serve uh, you in the best possible way. And I think that this time we have the opportunity to do that uh, in, uh, in an excellent way. So thank you so much uh, again, and uh, uh, good luck uh, for this next uh, uh, step, which will be crucial for the success of our common uh, endeavor. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador Baji. Uh, I'll now pass over to His Excellency Jean Daniel Rouge. Okay, I'm online. Thank you very much. I would like uh, to con congratulate you for your wonderful uh, moderation. Very precise, very long time. I would like to thank also uh, Jacques Korolny, Guidon Hamburger, and Peter Haredin for having set up this uh, conversation, which I hope <clears throat> is the beginning of a tri triangular cooperation between Israel, the UAE, and Switzerland. I think that <clears throat> Thomas Friedman was very right uh, when he wrote in the New York Times a few weeks ago that because the UAE-Israel axis brings together the most successful Arab state with the most successful non-Arab state, it is radiating a lot of energy. Definitely the normalization agreement between Israel and the UAE has liberated a lot of energy, ideas, projects, and enthusiasm. Maybe this is also related to the fact that Israel, as also was very well expressed by Friedman, has learned to go from isolation and scarcity to abundance and global influence by developing its own explosive innovation economy in areas such as water, solar, cyber, military, medical, finance, and agriculture, whereas the UAE, by contrast, is transitioning from decades of oil abundance to an era of oil scarcity by building its own ecosystem of innovation and entrepreneurship in the same fields as Israel. I think that the way this was expressed very much squares the potential of cooperation between the two countries and also the potential that there is for Swiss companies because Switzerland is also uh, an innovation hub and regularly ranks number one in the world in terms of innovation. Now to be able to operate in a new environment, you need to have a legal framework. And I was asked to very briefly present what is the situation of the talks between Israel and the UAE regarding the advancement of a legal framework for doing business between the two countries. I must say that we have to be impressed how uh, effective uh, the two countries, the two governments have been to establish such a framework. There is already uh, an agreement on protection of investments, which has been signed, which has been already ratified on the Israeli side and should be ratified soon, hopefully, on the UAE side. The double taxation agreement is under advanced negotiation. Uh, the air transport agreement is in, is in force. There will be, there should be flights uh, from Etihad starting at the beginning of April, so it's almost tomorrow. And finally, an agreement has been reached on a visa regime, uh, which should enter into force in July, but already now it's very easy to uh, get a visa online. And finally, as was announced very recently, a 10 billion investment fund has been announced. Uh, I'm told that the precise mechanism on how this fund 
will operate is in advanced discussion right now as we speak. I'm also told that more measures are being discussed between the two governments to improve the environment and to further encourage trade and investment between the two countries. What is our role in this context? Well, our role is to help you, all those of you who are interested, to connect either with the Israeli uh, startup scene or with the Israeli environment. Uh, as you can imagine, the Swiss enthusiasm for Israel is very much present. Over the past years, we have shepherded, organized uh, visits, meetings, events for thousands, literally thousands of visitors from Switzerland or Israelis who wanted to know more about each other's ecosystems. And also, we have helped companies to find the right contact in what is often seen as a startup jungle in Israel. Uh, you have noticed, I hope, that with David Bigelizen, we have an innovation officer at the Swiss embassy who not only is very well connected on both sides, on the Israeli side and on the Swiss side, but uh, also who is uh, definitely willing and who has a vision on how the relations can be uh, developed, improved, and how things can be done. Finally, I would like to thank also my colleague in Abu Dhabi, uh, Massimo Baggi, uh, for his uh, offer. And I think we should all uh, take his offer and uh, meet very soon in Dubai. So see you all very soon, either this year or next year at the Expo in Dubai. Thank you very much to all of you. And uh, I wish you, as uh, Gideon Hamburger said, uh, healthy rest of the week, of the day, and of the year. Thank you, Your Excellency, and uh, thank you again, uh, Ambassador Baji, uh, for both of your time and your words on this uh, webinar. Uh, there should be up on your screen now a slide with the email addresses of each of our panelists. Please feel free to contact them uh, should you have any further questions or comments. Uh, once again, thank you to all the panelists and participants of this evening's event. And with that, I would like to close the webinar and wish you all a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much.